pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague from New York, Anne Belford Ulanoff. Anne has been a strong womanly voice in Jungian studies for many decades. She holds the Christine Brooks Johnson Memorial Chair, established in memory of her student at New York's Union Theological Seminary, where she's a professor of psychiatry and, psychiatry and religion and she's also a Jungian analyst in private practice in Manhattan. Um, Anne has many, many books to her credit, certainly nine that I know of, and she is always at work. She's published many books of her own, and she published several with her husband, the late Barry Ulanoff. Her two recent titles are Spirit and Jung, the Unshuttered Heart, Opening to Aliveness and Deadness in the Self. So I'm so grateful that Anne is here with us today. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. In the Red Book, Jung encounters Elijah and Salome, who say to him, we are real and not symbols. And they express the tone of the whole volume, what the guide Philemon conveys. Psychic reality exists, it's there, it's objective, and addresses Jung in a series of images, figures, tasks. And though later, Jung reflects that these figures are personifications of unconscious thoughts. When he actually meets them, they are real experiences and evoke in him dread, loathing, confusion. He describes Salome as bloodthirsty horror, exclaiming, I fear her. He understood Salome to personify his feeling, which he had scorned as grossly inferior to his thinking, personified by Elijah. And even later, when Salome is redeemed into loving and offers her love to Jung, he says to her, you are like the serpent who coiled around me and pressed out my blood. And yet at the end of his encounters, he learns from Philemon that only through voluntary devotion to love do I arrive at my truest and innermost self. From this one of countless examples, we get a sense of what it is to read the Red Book. We plunge in, down, where encounters with the unconscious call us out, forcing us to tasks that if we avoid, we miss the boat. In painting 55, we see what Jung saw, that we all have a boat riding on the unconscious psyche, under which the serpent, the dragonfish, the monster of Fofus swims, threatening to swallow the son of consciousness. Jung was called to these encounters, forced by his own complexes that, when faced, yielded his vocation. He said, in my 40th year of life, I had achieved everything that I had wished for myself, but he had lost his soul and had to go find it. With fright, he asks his soul, into what mist and darkness does your path lead? I limp after you on crutches of understanding. I follow, but it terrifies me. And yet Jung recognizes, quote, this life is the way, the long sought after way to the unfathomable divine. Thus pairing psyche with soul to whom he says, your meaning is a supreme meaning and your steps are the steps of a god. Jung felt carried into fearsome territory beyond what Christ taught. The soul tells him, 
If you marry the ordered to the chaos, you produce the divine child, the supreme meaning beyond meaning and meaninglessness. Christ taught God is love, but you should know that love is also terrible. Christ overcomes the temptation of the devil, but not the temptation of God to good and reason. Identification then with what we call the good is not going to work anymore. For the soul tells him, nothing will deliver you from disorder and meaninglessness since this is the other half of the world. In response, Jung says, I swayed between fear, defiance, and nausea. Jung sees that as Christ knew that he was the way, the truth, and the life, I know that chaos must come over men. For him who has seen the chaos, he knows that the bottom sways. For he has seen the order and disorder of the endless. In short, the soul tells him, life has no rules. That is its mystery. We enter then a world of encounters, which Jung insistently claims as his own, saying, don't ape me. You have your own mysteries. Go there, find them. Jung is encountered by many figures. His meetings lead him to take leave of, quote, science, that clever knower that imprisons the soul in a lightless cell. To find another kind of knowing pertaining to the child God he comes to serve and to paradoxical over intellectual intelligence. The child God who is, quote, beyond being split between opposites, whose simple will we cannot learn for it can only become in you, brings an attitude without preconceptions of inexhaustible freshness. And from this uniting of opposites rises, arises a third, quote, the supreme meaning, the symbol, passing over into a new creation. Here, the symbol takes on incarnate life. It's not hanging in the air but acts as a solid bridge into daily life. For, as Jung writes, the divine wants to live with me. Further, this new meaning changes our grasp of how we understand. Quote, the spirit of the depths took my understanding and all my knowledge and placed them at the service of the paradoxical, the melting together of sense and nonsense, which produces the supreme meaning, the God yet to come. Jung, for example, encounters the uniting of below and above, the monstrous and devoted, the collective and individual, the divine and the human. And paradox also changes our relation to what we know. He no longer identifies with it but says, I do not myself become the supreme meaning, but the symbol becomes in me that it has its substance and I have mine. And even further, Jung distinguishes God and the image of God, saying it is not the coming God himself, but the image which appears in the supreme meaning. Chaos thus unites with order, and the God image we perceive and form on which we depend can always be destroyed. How does Jung get here to these thoughts? Only by going through hell, which he says means to become hell oneself. And he describes it as full of frightful noise, shrieking voices, 
where he discovers the thousand serpents that want to devour the sun are also in me. I myself am the murdered and the murderer, the sacrificer and the sacrificed. The upwelling of blood streams out of me. From refusals of such consciousness flow collective depredations, manifest then in World War I, manifest now across our globe in the countless cruelties we do to each other. Jung says, men fall on their brothers with mighty weapons and bloody acts when they do not know that their brother is themselves. One way or another, the sacrifice will be made, unconsciously in barbarism against each other and against the earth, as Philemon asks, do men atone for the ox with the velvet eyes? Or do penance for the shiny ore? Your bloodthirsty tiger growls softly while you, conscious only of your goodness, offer your human hand to me in greeting. And suddenly I felt a cruel hammer blow struck a nail into my temple. What then is the sacrifice? To sever our identification with what he calls our formations, such as the image of God or what we hold supreme for Jung at that time science, or what we experience as our ruling principle for Jung his thinking, the expansion of our subjectivity accompanies our opening to reality that lies beyond our images of its center. The ruling principle in each of us is the hero who must be slain. He writes, the heroic in you is the fact that you are ruled by the thought that this or that is good, the goal. Consequently, you sin against incapacity, but incapacity exists. No one should deny it or shout it down. When we succeed, quote, in making a god, our whole force has entered into this design. We desire to rise with the divine sun and become part of its magnificence but then we are no more than hollow forms. He continues, for our formation causes many good persons to bleed to death. When we lose our force to our formation, we try with unconscious cunning and power, demandingly to force others into following the God. By clinging to our formation, we push away anything opposite. And left unvalued, this incapacity, this inferior part, does not develop but degrades into monstrous form. But Jung finds that, quote, salvation comes to you from the discarded. Your son will arise from the swamps. And even more shocking, but the lowest in you is also the eye of evil that stares at you coldly and sucks your light down into the dark abyss. We need the help of evil to dissolve our formations, for we become bad in our goodness and do not know it. Hence, we must recognize, quote, our, compl our complicity in the act of evil for evil has to be accepted and must have a share in our life. This jarring encounter with his lowest, what he later calls his shadow, issues in Jung haranguing against, quote, his inordinate ambition. You don't work for humanity, you work for self-interest, he accuses. You consume yourself in rage and speak 
in cold daggers. What is concealed in you I will drag into light. You should be a vessel of life, so kill your idols. Yet Jung also harangues his soul, who has brought him to these realizations, accusing her of stealing, quote, the gold, the sparkling light of the jewel, and absconding with it to heaven. Jung insists that she tell him, what is this treasure, and give him what belongs to me, and beg for what you need from it. The soul finally confesses, it is love, warm human love, warm red blood, the holy source of life, the unification of everything separated and longed for. Jung protests, you get drunk on the blood of man and let him starve. Love belongs to me. I want to love, not you, through me. He insists she learn to honor mankind because you force us to labor for your salvation. And now she must work for, quote, the earthly fortune of humankind. This means taking back into the human interior not just his own lowest, his inferior part, but also his force that creates the gods, not just his shadow, but also his now redeemed feeling, the treasure of warm human love, and not just his personal matter, but what his encounters show him about what matters, the fundamental elements of reality. For example, Jung must embrace, quote, the serpent of God that wants human blood. For this serpent, life is part of the power that is different from the power of science. The serpent is the earthly essence of man which is not conscious. It is the mystery that flows to us from the nourishing earth mother from which everything that becomes emerges. It both causes Jung to become enslaved to his ruling principle and hence is an adversary, but also gives him wisdom, hardness, a wise bridge that connects the right and the left and leads to concretization on earth. The point here is not theory, but making a difference in life, in ethical action. Jung does unite with the serpent. He says, I took my part of the humiliation and subjugation upon myself. And he continues, the devil, who is the sum of darkness of human nature, now has no power over him. For Satan is the quintessence of evil, pure negation without force. Taking on the serpent, Jung fetters the devil and builds, quote, a firm structure that can withstand the fluctuations of the personal, and therefore the immortal in me is saved. The dead come back to Jung because their unlived life drove them to find the animal part they had failed to live. Jung says he takes over something of the dead into my day, and death that can never be canceled out gives me durability and stability when I recognize the demands of the dead in me and satisfied them. I sacrificed personal striving in the world, which then took me for dead. But the serpent says to him, life is yet to begin, which Jung himself perceives in saying that every day belongs to the image of the Godhead, echoing the words of Salome and Elijah that they are real, the everyday living serves the image we have of the ultimate, what we call God. And for this task of living the divine in every day, 
day, Jung has the help of the Kabiri, who grow from the flowers of the corpse of the slain dragon who devoured the sun of consciousness. Jung calls them possessors of ridiculous wisdom, first formations of the unformed gold. They have their origin in the lowest, and he asks them, are you the earthly feet of the Godhead? They say, we are the juices sucked out of inertia, affixed to what is growing. We carry up what is dead, yet enters into the living. We placed stone on stone, and now you stand on solid ground. And they give him a sword to slay them. For that will free Jung from his entanglement with his formations, his ruling principle, his scientific thinking. So from this encounter we learn what Jung learned. Destructiveness finds its ongoing place in life. He writes, the creating of the new prepares the destruction of precisely this day in the hope of leading it over into a new creation. As a result of these encounters, Jung experiences a change in his subjectivity. He says, I'm smelted anew in the connection with the primordial beginning of myself and the world. The formed in him dissolves, binds itself anew with the children of chaos, the powers of darkness, the ruling and seducing, the divine and the devilish. He writes, by accepting the lowest in myself, I lower a seed into the ground of hell. The seed is invisibly small, but the tree of life grows from it and conjoins the below and the above, beginning down where nothingness widens itself into unrestricted freedom. So in effect, the nowhere in us becomes the site of transcendence, for God is not now to be found in the absolute, but in the terrible ambiguity, quote, the hateful beautiful, the sick healthy, the new God will be found in the relative, born as a child for my own soul and from the human soul from the secret mystery of the individual. The arrival of the new comes not then as a descent of spirit from above, but from the below of matter, which for the psyche is the unconscious, that includes our personal narrative, but also the human narrative, the objective elements that must conjoin. We must do the work Jung says, when God enters my life, I bear the burden of poverty and everything reprehensible in me. With this, I prepare the way for God's coming. This is not hubris. This is service. And a bold way Jung describes his service is this. The depths will force you into the mysteries of Christ one is not redeemed through the hero, but becoming a Christ himself. We undergo the mysteries of conjoining the opposites and suffer what this conjunction brings. For Jung, it was conjoining thinking with feeling, science with magic, intellect with paradox, devil with God. And his way makes us ask, well, what is our way? And Jung writes, you make yourself into the vessel of creation in which the opposites reconcile, and thus you also serve others. If we are ourselves, he writes, we fulfill the need of the self, and through this become aware of the needs of the communal and can fulfill them. Then the life of God begins. 
May each one seek his own way. The way leads to mutual love and community. The change in his subjectivity accompanies the change in God images. The child, Christ, and Abraxas all turn up in Philemon's garden. Philemon tells Jung the dead rejected the God of love and the community of love. So I am teaching the God who blasts everything human, who powerfully creates and mightily destroys. And Philemon advises Jung to enter ever deeper into God, and Jung encounters the Lord of the Frogs. Quote, of bodily juices, the spirit of sperm and entrails, of the genitals, of the joints, of the nerves and the brain, the spirit of sputum and excretions. Abraxas, the name given to this god behind the godhead, is, quote, the creative drive, form and formation, sheer effectiveness that unites the fullness and vital force, God, with the sucking gorge of emptiness, the devil. Abraxas, who produces truth and lying, good and evil, life and death, in the same word and in the same act, is terrible. Out of the pleroma, which is fullness and nothing, the beginning and end of creation, Quote, our nature, our very nature, is differentiation. If we are true to our essence, we differentiate, and quote, the primor primordial creator of the world, the blind creative libido, becomes transformed in man through individuation, and out of this process arises a divine child, a reborn God, no more dispersed, but one, an individual, in all individuals, the same everywhere. A thread winds back to Christ, that we should be ourselves as truly as Christ was. Philemon says to Christ, what one individual can do for men, you have done. The time has come when each of us must do his own work of redemption. And Jung responds, I decided to do what was required of me. I accepted all the joy and every torment of my nature and remained true to my love to suffer what comes to everyone in their own way. So behind the work of individuation lurks the terrific power of Abraxas, the sheer force of being. And as man becomes differentiated, at a great distance, writes Jung, in the zenith stands a star. This is the one God of this one man. This is his world, his pleroma, his divinity, the God and goal of man. To this one God, man shall pray. Prayer throws a bridge across death. And Jung responds to his encounters by saying our task is to live oneself, to fulfill what comes to you. For our life is the truth we seek. We create the truth by living it. Speaking to the spirit of the depths, Jung exclaims, let me persist in divine astonishment so that I am ready to behold your wonders. This knowledge of the heart is in no book, but grows out of you like the green seed from the dark earth. And you attain this knowledge only by living your own life to the full and only if you also live what you never have lived. Jung's devotion to what he encountered 
made him recognize, quote, that I am as I am in this visible world and only the expression and symbol of the soul. I am thoroughly a servant of a child. And Philemon tells Jung, quote, you will be a river that pours forth over the lands and streams toward the depths. You will hold the invisible realm in trembling hands. It lowers its root into gray darknesses and mysteries of the earth and sends up branches covered in leaves into the golden air. It will stay green for a long time. Thank you.